Okay, again, our second panel discussed the future role of alternative energy and related technologies. I do need to make a note uh, for you all at the beginning. Eliano uh, Russo um, uh, uh, had some pressing matters. I think he was coming over from Italy, and so uh, he is not did not make it uh, for the uh, symposium today, but we still have a very distinguished panel speakers um, to address some uh, really important topics. Uh, Dr. Brian Hannigan will be our moderator for this uh, panel and and Brian uh, is the president and, and CEO of Holy Cross Energy, which is a member-owned electric uh, cooperative utility that provides electricity and energy products um, and services to consumers in several western Colorado counties. Some of those counties, probably some of you have skied in before. So if you guys have ever been on the lift and it stops right at the highest point, where it's really cold and windy, and you're just frozen and frustrated. Uh, talk to Brian about that, but I suspect it's more related to the ski uh, uh, slope issues than the uh, uh, consistency and continuity of the power that Brian's company provides. So, um, Before jo joining Holy Cross Energy in the spring of 2017, uh, Brian was a senior energy advisor for the White House and the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. He co-founded the U.S. Department of Energy's Grid Modernization uh, Laboratory Consortium, which uh, one of its tasks, of course, primary tasks is to seek to create a grid of the future through modernization and modern technology. Um, he's also led multiple research and development teams at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the Electric Power Research Institute, or many of us refer to it as EPRI, um, where they advance innovations in fossil fuel and renewable generation. Um, environmental compliance and electric electricity delivery and use. So, uh, Brian, welcome to you, and, and thank you for uh, leading our next panel. Great. Thank you, Jay. Much appreciate that introduction. Um, so welcome back, everyone. I hope you had uh, a good break, got caffeinated up and ready for a powerful uh, panel, too. Uh, we'll hope to emulate the great discussion that we had in the first panel, which I hope you all um, very much enjoy. So the focus of this panel is going to be on the alternative uh, and renewable energy technologies, and that includes the ones that we talked about a lot this morning already, wind and solar, but also all the other renewables that are out there. We'll talk about nuclear a little bit, uh, but we'll also go beyond uh, those generation resources on the upstream to talk about how these are affecting the delivery system, both for fuels, for heating, uh, and thermal energy, and also for the electric uh, production itself. We'll look at new uses, electric vehicles for transportation, that came up this morning, but also how do we look at the buildings, how do we look at our commercial, <laughs> our industrial, and our residential sectors differently uh, going forward, uh, and then really a focus, I think, on, on the delivery networks and specifically the, the electric grid. Um, I wanted to kind of add to the discussion this morning with uh, a little bit of context before I introduce our um, excellent panelists here. Um, over the sev last several years, there's been a not-so-quiet revolution in the area of alternative energy. And, and what I'm showing here are the uh, data from the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, from uh, where the undersecretary is uh, currently stewarding great research initiatives that are continuing this trend of declining costs shown in the blue bars for both large and small-scale renewables and energy efficiency technologies. Um, you can take a look between 2009 and 2015. We've seen the onshore wind energy costs come down over 40%. Utility scale solar over 60%. Uh, distributed solar by a little less over 50%. The cost of batteries for electric cars and energy storage by almost three quarters. The cost of LED lighting by over 95%. Right. And I could say the same thing about fuel cells and hydrogen technology. I could say the same thing about smart appliances. Everywhere you look, you see the blue bars going down, the costs declining, and the orange lines going up, in some cases quite significantly, and that's the, the level of deployment. Um, these trends are continuing. Uh, this is a chart from a, a resource plan that was filed by XL Energy in the state of Colorado not too long ago, showing the results of their request for proposals for new generation uh, in the southwest, or excuse me, southeast corner of the state. Um, you can see these costs, which are the average costs, looking down kind of midway. We've got wind energy coming in at basically a little under two cents per kilowatt hour there, 1996. 
uh, combinations of wind and solar. You've got battery storage with wind at a little over two cents. For solar without storage, 3.1 cents. And for solar with storage, 3.8 cents. These are the costs of projects for delivery in 2020, 2022, 2025. Uh, so we're obviously seeing these new resources come into the marketplace competing at a level of economics which give gas and other uh, generation resources a run for their money. So looking at all this, you got to wonder where did, where did all these innovations come from? It's a really great success story over the last several years. What did we do to bring about this revolutionary change? And how do we keep it going, go, uh, going forward, not only for these technologies, but for all energy technologies in general? And, and the pessimist among us might say, it, we've seen a lot of, of improvements. Have we hit a diminishing returns in R&D? Or are there still new technologies out there uh, yet to be discovered and developed? And we'll get into that a little bit during our panel. Uh, one of the things that these new technologies do do is they change the nature of the delivery system. And in particular, I'm focusing here on the electric grid. This cartoon from the DOE's Grid Modernization Initiative kind of shows the nature of the grid, the architecture of the grid as it existed uh, for the past hundred years in this country. You had large, always on central station generators on the left side producing uh, power in bulk delivering across the system, moving from high voltage to low or high pressure to low pressure in the fuel equivalent to a relatively passive customer there on the, on the far right side. And this was our architecture. It served us well. Uh, economies of scale won the day, uh, and it was largely reliable and affordable and, and uh, will still be so. However, when we look to the future grid, we start to see on the left-hand side these more variable sources of renewable generation coming into the market. And that's putting stresses and strains on the incumbent generators, the source of a lot of discussion in Washington and certainly at the state level. You see on the right-hand side the consumers that are now interacting with their electricity supply and doing the same for gas and for other fuels in a new and different way. You've got more and variable demands coming from emerging technologies in the homes and the businesses that we work in. And all that variability on either end of the spectrum takes what used to be a pretty fixed delivery infrastructure and now has to make it much more flexible in order to adjust to all the variability in supply and demand. Because as I learn all too well, when we don't balance supply and demand on the electric grid, bad things happen. Lights go out, refrigerators can't keep the food cold, you get stuck at the ski lift, evidently, Jay. Uh, and so these are things that we want to try to seek to avoid. The good news is there's a lot of innovation and technology development in that middle piece too, uh, which will uh, help us square that circle. So a lot of questions for this panel. Uh, if these trends continue, uh, what's the role of grid flexibility, of energy storage in a, in a future world where the demands from consumers are different, the supplies are much more variable and beyond our, our control? Um, how do the grid operators manage both the operations but also think about the business? One of the trends we talked about this morning was the push on energy efficiency uh, and the underlying improvements in our economy and how that's changing a business model in the power sector that, that both Michael and I can talk to that used to be built on growth, 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 and now it's built on doing more with less, and providing more services maybe with the same amount of energy if not a little less. And so how do you think about the financial model that that uh, implies? Um, how do we incorporate the millions, if not billions, of the smart devices? Um, how do we manage all of that data? How do we organize it in ways which allow us to intelligently control, dispatch uh, those resources to provide uh, value to both the consumer and to the energy system as a whole? Uh, what do we say about cybersecurity? when we're transacting much more data back and forth, when we have many more devices connected to the grid. In theory, those are more doors for people to come on in, but there's another school of thought that says that gives you much more resilience because now you're not beholden to a single point of failure in quite the same way. Um, as a customer, what about my privacy? If you know exactly what I'm using, when I'm using, where I'm using, you pretty much know what I'm doing. So how does that conflict with some of the time-honored ideals of, of privacy in, in, the, in this country? And then finally, who pays for all this stuff? What's the value proposition? What's the new business model? Where does the new company 
that's being started and created to go from? How does this all mix in with existing companies? And do we see more folks in the oil and gas field moving to become energy companies? Do we see power companies actually moving into providing heating that used to be the domain of natural gas or fuel oil? Do we become transit companies? Do the data companies transact with these smart devices and start managing the grid and providing services the other way? So many things to talk about. And the, the blessing that we have this morning is that we have a fantastic panel uh, to dive in deeply in the hour and a half that we have here. Um, first, I'm very pleased to have with us the Honorable Paul Dabar, who's the Under Secretary of Science for the Department of Energy. Um, he's the Principal Advisor at DOE on Fundamental Energy Research, Energy Technologies and Science. He's got all the really cool stuff going on. We talk about all the non-cool stuff at DOE that you don't have, uh, but you've got the really neat stuff, uh, and uh, I'm sure you'll share with us some of the great breakthroughs that are on the horizon, some of the things that DOE's already done to, to light a fire in this area, and, and we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, next, we have Tom Flaherty, who's the Senior Vice President for PwC's Strategy Consulting Group. He's got over 40 years experience working with the majority of power and gas companies and mergers and acquisitions in the U.S. as well as companies around the world. Um, Tom will no doubt tell us what the private sector will do with all this great stuff that's coming from the innovation community, from the universities, the laboratories, the, the governments around the world. Um, how does that change the power markets, the values of the assets, uh, and, and take kind of a holistic look? And then how do we make that work for the consumer? And then finally, at the far end, uh, my colleague in the power sector, Michael Britt, who's the uh, Southern Company Vice President in charge of their Energy Innovation Center. Um, Southern Company has one of the most impressive R&D programs anywhere in the utility sector, not just for size, but in terms of scope and their ability to take risks and do cool things that often the rest of us seek to follow. Uh, his focus in particular is on the customer side and how all of these new technologies move from uh, an idea to a commercial product to deployment at a scale and a pace that matters. Uh, so developments in the grid, in data analytics, in the end user, um, bringing the downstream to life uh, in addition to the upstream that we talk about with wind and solar and gas. So gentlemen, um, laid out a pretty healthy uh, menu of things to address. Take us where you will. Welcome to Oklahoma City. Thanks for being here. And uh, make it provocative, won't you please? Mr. Undersecretary, we'll start with you. Well, thank you for that, uh, that setup of everything that's going on in the industry. And it is, it is really exciting to be in the energy industry. I, where we are as a nation and the sort of things that we're working on, I think, uh, and the Secretary and the President think, this is, this is the, the, the peak of, if you look across the energy industry, where we're at as a country, whether it is in oil and gas production, where on a, boy, uh, on, on, a, on a BOE basis, we're number one in the world. We're the largest producer of, of combined oil and gas in the world right now. Who would have thought that 10 years ago, right? But on top of that, if you take a look at how much we've done in renewables, how much we've done across all the different spectrum, we continue to lead. And obviously this state at number three on the wind side is very big, not only in oil and gas, but also in renewables. Um, if you look at the environmental impact, and that was talked about in the first panel, we reduced uh, over the last eight-year snapshot period from 2016, uh, which is the last time we have full data for the world, we led the world in the reduction of greenhouse gases. So when we sit down and talk with people internationally and we say, well, what are you actually achieving, right? So what we're, what we're achieving is low prices for the customer, highest ever production of energy across all the different spectrum. Most of that, by the way, is driven by technology. And I'll talk a little bit about that and talk about this further, obviously, the purpose of this panel. And we're doing it in a much better environmentally um, uh, positive way than any other industrialized uh, country in the world. We lead the, the rest of the industrialized country. And if you add China in there as, as, uh, in that list, we also lead them. So these are amazing times to be in this industry. It's a very positive time, and I think some of the trends that this panel has is particularly interesting to us. Um, the Department of Energy is a, is a big enterprise. Most people don't fully appreciate everything that's done at, at the department. 
we managed a nuclear weapons uh, for the United States, uh, and that's a very large portion of the Department of Energy uh, across a very vast uh, complex. Taking that aside for a second, uh, the research side of DOE is also vast. The DOE lab complex, for those of you who are not familiar, the 17 national labs, one of which Brian worked at before, uh, was, a, was a major leader at, uh, so always love alumni. Um, uh, is, uh, is, is, is the leader in the country uh, for R&D for the physical sciences, including all of, all of energy. Uh, the 17 labs, you probably know some of the names, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Brookhaven, Argonne, Stanford, Berkeley, Livermore, it keeps going. Uh, they started with the weapons complex, but they evolved into a, a vast kind of co uh, uh, complex of, of research. We spend $9 billion a year in R&D. It is by far the largest amount of money that's spent any place. It's higher than any individual university. Uh, we work with all the universities uh, around the country. We have a $3.1 billion a year grant program for the university. So on top of the th $9 billion that we do research for ourselves, we also grant it to OU and every place else in all, all 50 states. And so we fund, we fund research, we fund STEM in terms of students and grants. So it is a vast complex, and we do a lot with that. Um, the particular areas that we mentioned that we do a, 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 you know, quite a bit about right now, and the, each one of these is a long conversation, so batteries and storage. Uh, we have a, a, a significant amount of research well beyond uh, in very different chemistries than lithium ion. So we're, we're in the area of the world where we're commercialized, so people here in the commercial sector go and commercialize technologies. We're at the low TRL level basic research to do things that, uh, you know, uh, that the private industry really has pulled back on, especially over the last couple of decades. Us and the university system focus an awful lot on, on basic research. So energy storage, cyber obviously is a big area for us that we do research in, a lot of renewables uh, and grid management, uh, a lot of early stage oil and gas production research that ends up uh, out, out in the commercial sector in particular on the data management side and high performance computing, the most powerful computers in the world are at the DOE labs and they basically for the life of computing it is. So our capabilities are well beyond Google or anyone else in terms of uh, general computing, uh, but also artificial intelligence and machine learning, which has vast applicability to grid management and oil and gas production, major upside topics uh, that we're working on. Quantum computing, which obviously using uh, photons of light to program rather than uh, transistors, uh, would make a monumental change in computing and applications to the energy sector. So there's a there's a vast amount that's done. Uh, we're we're very glad to support the country. Uh, we have a strong purpose in innovation, and uh, it's sometimes hard for us as a country to compete on price on certain topics but we can compete on innovation, and the energy industry across <coughs> oil and gas and renewables is a great example of what's happened, especially over the last decade on that, and uh, we're glad to be uh, a small part of that. Great, thank you. Tom, let's turn to you. All right, I'm gonna talk about things perhaps from a little bit different perspective. Um, so I work a lot with the power sector and with their customers. So I'm really going to talk about downstream as opposed to the traditional upstream here. And I'd say the one thing to take note of right now is we're, we're in a kind of a different environment for the power sector. This is about technology push and customer pull. And the technology push is coming from a number of different uh, factors. The first is the entrance to the market are not your traditional energy suppliers, energy participants. You're seeing a lot more OEMs and um, consumer products entities get into the marketplace. So they're bringing a mindset with them, accompanied with the technology, <clears throat> that opens up, uh, widens the aperture, if you will, for customers in terms of how they think about questions around supply. But the other side of it is that you know energy as a as a <clears throat> com component, a commodity cost of their finished goods, if it's not the highest, it's usually the second highest <clears throat> cost of someone's raw raw materials and, <clears throat> and finished product. 
So it's very important, uh, particularly when you get price competition globally, that people are managing energy costs. And while companies have had energy management uh, departments for a long period of time, they're originally established for a different purpose than what they face today. They didn't face renewables before. They didn't face the notion of, of what's going on with things like storage and intermittency. <clears throat> so they have to have a different kind of mindset and capability than they have in the past. But there's four factors which probably drive what's going on broadly with the environment. So the first is policy. Um, sometimes it's the federal level, but a lot of it happens to be local. So a few years ago, around the topic of renewables, we went through this in the, uh, the early uh, portion, let's say the 03 to 08 time frame, <clears throat> where we, we called it the Governor's Cup. Uh, when renewables looked like they could become an option that would be economically viable, and it was viewed as something that would contribute to other decarbonization or emissions control, uh, climate change related goals, <clears throat> um, governors began to establish standards. So one governor would say, I want 15% renewables by 2020. And the next guy would come along, well, I want 20% by 2020. Then, of course, it became 25% by 2020. And it became sort of a bidding war, one-upsmanship. <clears throat> and that really resulted, though, in mandates that people had to fulfill. So the, the power sector was, was scrambling at that point in terms of what would they do about that. Technology comes along, and it's not just the economics. And, and, and Paul has talked, and will probably talk more, um, you know, about just the economics of some of these technologies. <clears throat> they are dropping very, very rapidly, just as as uh, Brian pointed out. But what goes along with that is the performance of the technology. So it's become much more reliable. <clears throat> it's become much more flexible and adaptive. I think the third thing which which comes along probably is really around um, efficiency broadly. Because efficiency now has reduced the, uh, or excuse me, has increased <clears throat> the um, operation of almost every appliance that you have in your home, somewhere between you know 50 and 70 percent in some cases. Uh, Brian mentioned 95 percent with LED lighting. Um, <clears throat> it would also increases the efficiency of every building we sit in. So probably this building, you know, may not be a lead facility at this point, <clears throat> but commercial office buildings right now are inc inc incredibly more efficient than they used to be in the past. So <clears throat> what that boils down to, though, is when you have policy combining with technology and reflecting the nature of, of efficiency, <clears throat> and you have the, the let's say, the exter externalities around carbon, it's led many individual companies to really focus on sustainability. And sustainability not just as a corporate goal, but sustainability as a strategy. And so besides the reporting requirements that most investor groups now sort of demand <clears throat> around what are you doing around sustainability and the activism that you see in certain shareholder groups, people have realized that sustainability is a good business. And people have done the studies <clears throat> and tried to make a correlation between those companies that spend more time on sustainability <laughs> actually have higher shareholder value than those who, who don't. So it's, it's actually becoming real economics to, to companies. <clears throat> well, where this leaves, let's say, the power sector is, is with the real dichotomy of how they've acted in the past versus how they'll have to add, uh, act in the future. But power companies make money by building, spending the capital, and earning on that capital. So it's, it's not like they build and they're simply selling through PPAs, because PPAs has a smaller margin associated with that. <clears throat> but when you think about the kind of capacity that, that the industry has built in the past, it was baseload capacity broadly. So it was nuclear coal. Um, nuclear's heavy capital intensity, low operating costs, low fuel costs, so high returns. <clears throat> Coal is moderate, you know, capital costs, high operating costs, uh, <clears throat> low to moderate, you know, fuel costs, depending on the volatility of it. Gas is very low capital costs, higher operating costs, and much higher volatility around the fuel costs. You take renewables, it's almost no capital per unit. <clears throat> it's low operating costs and what fuel cost. So you think about the investment profile of companies in the future that are on the power side. They have a real you know, dichotomy now when you see 200, 200 gigawatts of base load capacity between coal and nuclear dropping off of the system, either because of a uh, poor economics or an inability to make the investment to clean up coal, or because prices in the marketplace are driving higher capital intensity plants like nuclear sort of off the market right now. So we're seeing things that we never thought would happen before. Nuclear was built for a 40-year life. People have now received licenses for 60 years. They think they can extend them to 80. But as the market economics are now driving nuclear off the grid. Um, at the same time, when you flip it over to the customer side, the industrials and the commercial customers, let's say the corporates broadly, they become much more um, directly involved in everything that's going on with energy supply. 
So corporations right now are going direct to, supply, to suppliers for renewables. So you have a lot of people, uh, for example, um, your tech companies, Google's, Amazon, Facebook's, Apple, pe people like that, they're actually building some of their own and buying directly. You have other industrial companies like, like Dow and DuPont that are buying you know, renewables directly uh, in terms of supply and people in, in other portions of uh, the economy like the, nat the uh, national government and then other people like Walmart from and P&G from a consumer point of view. So the whole dynamics of how end-use customers interact with their suppliers is very, very different today than it used to be. But it extends also down to the residential or the, the local premise customer. You have more options today, but the problem is most residential consumers are not aware of the options that they have. They're becoming increasingly aware because of the Internet. And just to, I know we'll talk about the Internet of Things, but just to plant a, plant a seed here, it's really the Internet of everything. It's not just the Internet of Things, <clears throat> particularly as it relates to energy. Um, those consumers are finding about the possibilities through the Internet or from alternative suppliers. So we always like to tell this analogy. We're working with a very large customer um, utility company in the Southeast. And this was one of those someone said to someone to someone at a cocktail party. <clears throat> Nest had sold um, 600,000 Nest thermostats in the service territory of the utility. And the utility, and this is a three million uh, customer company, had no idea. So if you think about what the size of those, the, 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 those uh, 600,000 thermostats have in terms of supply and how a utility might not see 350 to 500 megawatts capacity just drop away when people began to control it, <clears throat> that gave you a sense of you know, how people, the jungle drums were beating to provide the information to consumers in a way that the power provider the, the, the incumbent, you know, was just not considering. So I'll say one more thing about, you know, innovation, let's say, and then we'll kind of pass it back to, to Michael, who's going to pick up on some of these points. <clears throat> um, innovation, in, in, in my sense, or from my perspective, in the uh, energy sector is still at the very, very front end of being embryonic. You can think about what all the things the government does to, to provide seed technology and perspective and funding. But when you think about it, <clears throat> we run a survey called the Global 1000. And the, <clears throat> there's a high correlation between um, those people who are the most um, widely respected for innovation and their effectiveness at managing the amount of spending. So Apple is always number one, but they spend less than 3% of their money on R&D. The pharmaceutical industry, on the other hand, is farther down the list between the, you know, 10 and the top 20. Maybe Johnson Johnson's up in the top 10. But they spend more like 15 to 20 percent of R&D. So there's no correlation between how much you spend and how widely are you respected. But there's more people you know, becoming very interested in this. The oil and gas sector probably spends at best six-tenths of a percent of their revenues on R&D. And the power sector, you can't measure it in terms of what they spend. So there's a, that's why I say it's very, very embryonic. A lot of the innovation that occurs, and someone like Southern, for example, has had their, their R&D group. Uh, they're the National Sequestration Center for Carbon uh, in Birmingham. Um, they've been at coal for a, and nuclear for a long, long time. So they have one of the, one of the, the larger and more established you know, R&D groups. Most companies don't have that anymore. They've gotten out of that. The, the, the intellectual portion of the business sometimes has atrophied simply because of budget pressures and the fact that demand destruction has occurred. So people focus on innovation, but there's three kinds of innovation. There's incremental, there's advanced, and there's breakthrough. And the incremental is really more operational. It's what can I do to put tools in the hands of people to make them more productive. The second part is advanced, which is really more about creating new revenue streams, new products and services, and finding you know new markets. <clears throat> Most of the innovation you would expect to see is going to be incremental. You would see a smaller amount of advanced. But the third category is the really interesting one, and you're going to see the smallest amount of this, which is really breakthrough innovation, which is changing the entire business model for how an industry works. You can say that renewables is sort of a breakthrough innovation. I'd say it's probably more of an advanced. Storage is closer to being a breakthrough innovation you know, in terms of how it's going to be applied. So I think those are, those are some comments just around where the corporates are at this point. But I think the takeaway that we'll probably come back to is we need to think about the end user voice. Because a lot of times we talk about upstream and as if we're just producing capacity and product to ship somewhere. But most of the, the innovation and the advances that occur upstream come from the downstream sector with end users who either have an issue or a need. So again, I'll just echo one more comment. This is from the power sector perspective. This is the most exciting time to be in this industry since Thomas Edison. And that goes way, way back. 
<clears throat> the other thing is there's going to be more innovation in the next 10 years than there's been in the last 50. So it's an exciting time, particularly for your students, to be around this sector. Thank you, Tom. Great, great innovation, great opportunity. Uh, I like to say to the folks that we serve, we serve members, which are euphemistic for customers. I like to say we got to give the members what they want before somebody else does. I know that's the same at, at Southern, and uh, Mike, I'd love your thoughts on how you're looking at the customer side of the equation amid all the trends and changes and opportunities that we've talked about so far. Absolutely. Uh, you know, our, our CEO always says, manage your business or someone else will manage it for you. And I think that's really at the heart of this. If you don't uh, focus on your customer relentlessly, if you aren't really understanding what is driving the decisions around energy and, and the value that we as a group, if you think about the, the capability of where we are right now, this place right here, the people in this room are part of one of the greatest transformations in energy in American history and have been over the last few decades, but particularly the last 10 years. If you think about what has changed in this business and what will change in the next 10, it's mind-boggling. Innovation around the things that our customers are wanting are driving those investments. But this is an industry that responds to tough times. When the backs are up against the wall, it seems like an incredible innovation, incredible breakthrough comes, comes along. We mentioned storage. Today, it's that central station generation, one-way grid. That hasn't changed. We drew a beautiful picture, but most of that is still that way. It's still that one-way grid. And most of the customers are still that very uh, passive customer at the end of the meter. But in reality, what's starting to happen, and, and uh, we started to touch on it, the Walmarts, the, the large users, the large corporates are saying, hey, I want to be 100% renewable. I want to be zero carbon by 2030, 2050, things like that. Just like the Governor's cup, cup, there's the CEO's Cup now around those commitments. And they're admirable commitments. But that's going to require real, real significant innovation to get even close to numbers like that in any time soon. And the bridge fuels of natural gas, things like that, to get us there, that's a big piece of how we will continue to drive um, reductions in emissions in this country. Electrification will be a, a component of this. Um, and we see that as an important role. So at the Energy Innovation Center, we focus on three things. One is the culture of innovation inside our business, but also the culture of innovation in the businesses and communities we serve. And that addresses, again, a lot of the incremental in, uh, innovation. We also focus on the business model. Now, we know the current make, move, and sell utility business model has an expiration date. It's been smudged, though. We don't know exactly what that date is, when we actually get completely disintermediated or disrupted. We need to disrupt ourselves and have the courage to do it. Any idiot's going to jump off a burning platform. But will you jump off a burning platform before it burns, knowing it'll burn? We know this will burn. Are, are we ready to jump off in a blue sky day and take some significant risk and, and have the courage to, to lead? That's part of what we have to be focused on in the communities we serve and leading in innovation. Um, but the business model evolution, we have to help our businesses evolve. We have to help our businesses see the changing environment and the integration of technology, data, and so forth. What can we really do from that? How can we unlock the value of what I call gray data? So we've got data that's available to us all throughout the supply chain, all through the value chain. But today, it might be a single use or a single function. I think in terms of data analytics and energy, we're at the cave painting stage of where we could be in terms of unlocking. You know, think about uh, when you go on the computer and you're trying to get to something and it's grayed out. It's there, but you don't have access to it. There's an enormous amount of that gray data on the grid that we could begin to utilize more effectively. And we, we heard about 
some exciting things last night in terms of DOE developments and things that um, we're excited about. Then you move to microgrids. So we're working with Oak Ridge National Labs on building neighborhoods of the future. We built one in Birmingham. We're building one in Atlanta. <clears throat> we're trying to understand how are people going to use energy 20 years from now, 30 years from now, because we have to make long-term bets on fuel types, on in infrastructure, and so forth. Think about how different the energy business is today, but yet if you have to make that 20, 30-year investment in a power plant, how are you going to do that? How will people use energy? And so we are building from the ground up the most advanced homes in terms of efficiency, uh, in terms of, of um, giving customers transparency and control through innovation and technology. Uh, but they use about a third of what, um, what a traditional new home, which is much more efficient than the 1950 home that I live in, new homes being built today. This, these homes are all 30%, use about 30% of the energy. So that's going to be a challenge as, as, as an industry, declining use per customer. We have to find ways to drive more value for our customer and understand where that, where that future is going to go. Great, thank you. Um, so I've got a lot of questions for you guys. I think the first one I want to start with is um, in the entire landscape of innovation and, and research and development that's out there, what's the one thing that you think is going to be the most impactful over the next five to ten years um, and, and why? Um, Paul, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, so I, I would echo Tom's point around, around batteries and storage. It really does have the capability of making some tremendous moves. There's a reasonable chance. It's a very, very easy uh, um, kind of uh, runway to get to batteries that are uh, that have uh, double the capacity, uh, the energy density at half the price. That's actually pretty much on top of us in terms of where the development pipeline is. We could easily be with some of the battery designs that we're working on. They could be three times more powerful for 20% of the cost. And so, uh, you know, when you take a look at, you know, uh, you know, for personal electronics, for grid support, for uh, electric vehicles, we're actually even uh, having conversations around eVTOL. And I don't know how many people here know about what eVTOL is, but it's. It's basically drones that people could use for transportation and putting two or four people on a very large drone with and you need a more powerful battery uh, to be able to fly around. And you're getting people like Airbus and Uber who are very seriously looking at this. Um, there's a lot of implications for batteries that that uh, that that affect across all of those and in the grid in the grid system. The ability to support uh, renewables to uh, to uh, take around the intermittency aspect, and I think uh, you know a great data point was was the Excel uh, RFP responses that you got. I think one of the challenges for uh, coal and nuclear, and I'm my background is in nuclear, so I definitely love the topic, is that if you look at the new bid construction, and the data showed this is great data, that the new bid for wind and or solar with storage, so it, it basically solidifies, you know, you know, gets rid of the intermittency at anywhere from three to four cents, and that's what the bids were that you saw with batteries. That actually is is quite similar to the current operating costs of some coal and nuclear. So when everyone sees about the pressure for coal and nuclear, why are they getting pressured? The data that was shown is great data that shows why that's that's going on. I want to give one thing, and I was talking to the governor about this yesterday. And so amongst other things that DOE does, we have uh, many utilities that we actually own. So we're um, – and uh, including here in Tulsa, uh, Southwest Power Marketing Administration with dams, uh, but also much, much larger uh, uh, dam uh, hydroelectric uh, utilities out of Denver uh, and Bonneville uh, up in the Pacific Northwest. And this is an interesting data point just for people to hear what's going on in terms of pressure. People used to think that hydroelectric was always cheaper than everything else and that the government-owned dams that were from the Army Corps of Engineers were always going to be cheaper than you could buy it from a local utility. 
we're actually reaching a point that with natural gas prices so low, thanks to a lot of people here in this room and great technology, and with wind, and this is mostly in the Northwest, so mostly wind, but solar is very similar to that, that the, that the market prices for electricity are, 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 and this is wonderful for customers, is driv- getting driven down so low that actually hydroelectric is getting pressured. So it's not only coal, not only nuclear, but even hydroelectric is getting pressured in terms of its competitiveness. So what I think is important for the broader energy sector is that if you see certain segments that technology is driving down costs, increasing performance, and we're seeing that in natural gas turbines and natural gas prices, so the whole natural gas stream, uh, we're seeing that in wind, solar, you know, several others. If the other energy provider fuel types do not have uh, a constant increase in, in efficiency around technology, they're going to get pressured because they're standing still, and these others are, are, are being driven forward. That, that's a fantastic point. Before you give up the mic, I want to ask you, what are you seeing in those other technology provider areas? Are you seeing the same sort of emphasis and momentum around innovation and improvements? Is that a gap that societally we might want to address? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the two areas that are that are most pressure right now is around coal and nuclear out of the whole general stack of types of, uh, of energy sources. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's at least from our point of view, we're a basic research or, or a, a, you know, organization and we are, uh, it's hard for the commercial industry to come up with all the R and D funds and focus given near term, uh, financial needs for being, uh, for, for, you know, for, for being private entities. So we are on the nuclear side looking at, uh, we're working with New Scale and some other uh, uh, nuclear, uh, new, new reactor providers to, to come on uh, uh, and provide a technology that potentially could be lower cost and simpler uh, than the current technology. And we're, we're pushing that along uh, and helping fund some of those. So we, we, help, we help those areas too. And then on coal, we continue to, to work forward on carbon capture. Uh, and around other uh, cost cost areas associated with a coal stream, because once again, uh, you know, from from our point of view as a as a as a management team at uh, at the department, we're about all the above, right? And every single one. So we're, you know, those areas that need help uh, in terms of technology, uh, we want to certainly support them. Great, thanks. Let me invite the other panelists. Um, aside from storage, since we've covered that one. What other items on the horizon, five, ten-year time frame, do you think will be really disruptive, really good breakthroughs? Uh, I think I think um, computing, data analytics, uh, the intersection of energy and data, is really where it's going to be. And if you think about the potential of quantum computing, this concept is hard to wrap your mind around how different the computing capability will be with computing. So uh, let's imagine if you were trying to de- decrypt the current level of military encryption in the United States using traditional supercomputing, it would take you millions of years to get there. On the other hand, if you uh, use quantum computing, it's roughly about the same time it takes for a fastball to reach home plate. Just wrap your mind around the difference in capability. What's that, what is that going to do? It will impact every aspect of society, the knock-on effects of having that kind of capability in the world. Who knows what that will mean? But I think that's one where access to data, being able to truly unpack, uh, you know, the network effects of telecommunications allowed you to route a, a, a packet from A to B at the speed of light on fiber. Really, this is something at that level of, of impact to us as you begin to use blockchain or other technologies to, uh, to allow you to use distributed ledgers uh, all around the, the world to transact energy and allow you to unpack and actually ship the molecule that was produced or the, uh, the electron that was produced to the user who wants to use it in a virtual sense. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. The, what, on, a, on the classical computing side, um, we're building our first exascale computer. We're actually building three of them. Um, and that is 10 to the 18th calculations per second, 
That's a billion, billions calculations a second. And what we can do with that capability uh, across medical and science and so on is vast. Uh, but one of the things that we're uh, doing uh, is to build machine learning and artificial intelligence around energy management. And let me give you an example. Um, so in the Pacific Northwest, uh, our lab that we have up there works with our our captive utility, Bonneville. So we have, a, we have a test bed based on the fact that we have our own utilities where we're building machine learning algorithms around grid management in which we collect all the data, you know, every minute of the day uh, that's going in and around the grid. So what the weather is like, what the weather's like down in California, what are all the flows on every single line through each breaker, through each interconnection, what the wind is like hitting every single wind farm in the Pacific Northwest of reservoir levels. And, we're co and, and then looking back through time, the having an algorithm learn from itself of where the failures happened because or where the stresses were, where particular intertie tripped because of, you know, demand from California or so on. And then basically collect all that data all the time and then the algorithm learning from itself and coming up with ideas. And it does a couple of things. One, it predicts when a failure might happen and it gives warning to the operators and said you should be looking at this because this is how you know we can predict that this is about the you know problems about to happen and then they will give a solution the algorithm will give a solution and saying you should change the flow at this dam to this you should ramp down this you have a peaker plant over here you got to ramp it up um, you know and dispatch everything uh, very differently having a computer an algorithm having, you know, engineers who, you know, historically this, you know, and currently this is done very manually with a grid, people just having experience and looking at it, writing an algorithm with that amount of computing power and that amount of data to be able to basically say, this is how you should run your grid. And obviously, even at some point, this is far down the road, actually have artificial intelligence to just manage the grid for you based on the same sort of algorithms. I could go through how do you run a refinery, how do you run a chemical plant. By the way, as many of you know, you know, even production of a well is machine learned now, right? So, you, so taking the geologist, taking the petroleum engineer, and and actually doing an algorithm, creating an algorithm for an operation of this particular well and how to optimize it minute by minute um, is already in process. And that's going to improve efficiency. Uh, that's going to be a, a gigantic change across all the different spectrum of the energy sector. And not only that, the computing power can be applied to the forecasting of the wind and the solar and the hydro resources themselves at increasingly finer and finer time scales and spatial scales, the kinds of things that when I was a meteorology student here at OU, I had no concept of. Um, and that allows us to actively begin to predict rather than react to the disturbances, the variability on the grid. By the same token, we also have all this data now coming from the consumer side, so we can actually predict what their demands are going to be and what they look like and how we should best set up to respond that. That drives a lot of inefficiencies out of the system, and I, I want to come back to how that impacts the business model here in the next question. Let me just uh, maybe close this comment off with a couple of things. <clears throat> First of all, I think you have to – you asked about five to ten years. <clears throat> so there, that's kind of a loaded question because it's really about how fast will yep. people adopt. It's not what the uh, possibilities are. It's how people deploy them. So you think about the, the power grid today. And it, it applies probably to the oil and gas uh, you know, system or network itself. <clears throat> it's centralized. It's analog. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of ubiquitous. You, know, you can kind of – you see it as one integrated system. <clears throat> if you look at what the options might be going forward, it's going to be distributed, it's going to be digital, and it's going to be domain-based, which means a lot of things will have self-sufficiency to it. <clears throat> I think there's probably three things in the nearer term that have, have an impact just in terms of you know technology deployment. One, I think, is, is blockchain. <clears throat> and a blockchain may have particular applicability in the oil and gas sector because this, this industry seems to do a lot of things still manually. So with all the things it does around production <clears throat> and the number of parties and counterparties that are involved, a lot of paper processing, just manual processing, and the number of transactions that they do, if you just exponentially you know, go by <clears throat> production well and, and just look at the number of parties, it just grows over time exponentially. Um, <clears throat> 
And I think that it has broader application too. And the people right now who are behind some of that are, are folks like Goldman and BP. They're very interested in driving blockchain down through everything because it's a global trading network and you need transparency and you need instant you know, transaction closure. I think another thing that, um, <clears throat> that will happen is really around the data analytics side. We put a lot of sensors you know, on equipment out there, but the industry, and I'll talk about the power industry because I don't know as much about the oil and gas side, is much more um, attuned to doing failure analysis <laughs> rather than predictive analysis. And doing vibration analysis for understanding that how is a piece of equipment operating, and do we do we have a little flutter <clears throat> that is indicative of something that has a, you know, potential to, to fail in the near term um, that you want to, with with some lead time, that you want to be taking uh, you know consideration toward. Um, the data analytics piece is. It's not even embryonic within the power sector at this point. <clears throat> if, if someone tells you that we've hired data scientists, you know, ask them to introduce them to you. And when that one person shows up, <laughs> you'll be a good person to know. <clears throat> but to really be serious about data analytics, you have to have an entirely different infrastructure around it and capacity to frame the kinds of information that you need. So you put a smart meter in, for example, utility companies would <clears throat> you know, would bill you know once a month. <clears throat> so you get whatever the number of customers are, time the number of bills. With smart meters, you can you can take measurements right now at every 15 minutes or five if you choose. So you multiply that across 24 hours times 30. And <clears throat> just the amount of data that you have, but just collecting the data is pretty meaningless unless you know what to do with it. So you've got to do things, for example, which take advantage of the algorithms, for example, that Paul is talking about, <clears throat> to be able to sort through billions of pieces of information rather than just you know tens of thousands of pieces of information in terms of regular cycle. I think the third thing, <clears throat> I'm sure we'll probably talk about this separately, that has more of an impact perhaps in five years, is <clears throat> what can happen because of batteries, but a few other things with electric transport. <clears throat> so electric transport, um, Michael and I just did a, an article on this, <clears throat> you know, really is, is, has been behind the curve in terms of expectations. It's had a lot of headwinds. You know, we haven't had much awareness and promotion. You know, we've had low at the pump prices. We haven't had the kinds of battery breakthroughs up to this point. We haven't had the models that people actually want to go acquire. <clears throat> now it's starting to get, you know, um, some tailwinds instead of facing the headwinds. And so I think that, that EV, uh, particularly from a power sector, this is one that the industry ought to be thinking about because it is load creating. And we're living in an environment right now where it's actually load destructive <clears throat> between what's happening because of efficiency and what happened to the economy you know, starting in 2007 or 8. Um, <clears throat> so that can have a real short-term impact. And because of what you can do if you have proliferation um, and the impact that it has in terms of the uh, supply requirements, and the impact that has on system reliability, <clears throat> you know, it can be load creating if you actually do this well. And you, this is something that can grow toward ubiquitousness. We're way behind the rest of the world. Our OEMs are, they're, they're, it's hard to even say they're catching up. The U European and the Asian OEMs, the vehicle manufacturers, are way out in front. <clears throat> and they're, they're, they're changing their entire production portfolio to all electric as opposed to some portion of you know, models will be electric or there'll at least be one electric option among a model category. <clears throat> so the, the U.S. just has to, has to really get its, its game <laughs> to be able to be successful here. But EV is a quick way to advantage two industries, the automobile, man <clears throat> excuse me, the automobile manufacturers and the power sector. We've been taking a look at electric vehicles on our system, and we're you know 60,000, not 9 million customers. So we're a little smaller than, than Mike's group over there. But we've been looking at what EVs can do for us in terms of load creating, to use your term, Tom. The bigger values, actually, that we see is that it's flexibility creating, right? These are little batteries on wheels. And to the extent that we can manage them you know, in a loose sense while still giving the customer the mobility opportunities and demands satisfied that they need, that may actually be a more cost-effective way for us to bring flexibility into our system, but it implies a completely different business model, not just for EVs, but for the rest of the grid, because as power utilities, and I think it's true in the, generally in the energy space, we make money on volume. We make money on infrastructure and rates of return in a regulated environment, and in a competitive environment, we make money on volume. But what's interesting is that for a power utility, most of our costs actually are now increasingly falling into the fixed category, precisely because the fuel costs, the variable costs, are going away as we shift from the 
capitally intensive fuel variable oil and gas and, and coal and nuclear over to these renewables and other technologies that are, are less or even zero in terms of their fuel cost. So when I think about the world of innovation that we've described and these trends that you know, I think all of us agree on, and I think about this, this need to change the business model, um, how does one make investments going forward in this environment? We're in a business school. Folks are thinking, what am I going to do to start my business or what's my thesis when I go into energy management? How does one look at this much more rapidly changing landscape? And you know, is it really trying to catch a falling knife? Can we apply lessons from other sectors that have gone through this kind of transformation, like telecom and others? Um, what do we make of all this? Let me, let me try and okay. s start. I love the falling knife uh, uh, idea. That's kind of, that, that is at, at, at its heart, this is about risk at this point in time. There's so much uncertainty. Uh, however, the investments that that are being made right now will be the foundation for the energy future that we have. And I think a safe place to be investing is in making the grid more, uh, modernizing the grid, hardening the grid, increasing sustainability, reliability, uh, making sure that um, we have access to the data coming off of it to be more effective, driving O&M out of our business because the reality is if we don't have O&M costs under control, it's hard for us to get those capital dollars to, to reinvest in the business. And right now, we're in the middle of modernizing a lot of our uh, operations throughout the business and thinking about how do, we, how do we focus on data analytics, how do we focus on uh, growth. And I will, I will admit that Tom's statement about where we are, it's not embryonic even we are still trying to understand what that potential is. But I think that's a place where if you're looking to start a business that would have an impact, it's helping to get access to data, helping utilities get better access to data, understand how to operate more efficiently and effectively. A lot of the things that are being done right now at Bonneville, for instance, around how to optimize the grid operations, those are important learnings. We're also working together with Oak Ridge National Labs on our <coughs> microgrid. Uh, they've got microgrid technology operations to optimize the microgrids as well that we're using in our neighborhoods of the future. But we're trying to understand right now how to invest. We're trying to look at those kinds of things, and that's part of why we're doing what we're doing with uh, those homes of the future. I'll add a little anecdote from our side. So we were, we were the site, the host of one of the first community solar projects in Colorado. At the time that project came online, we paid what we thought was going to be an awesome price for solar. You know what it was? 12 cents per kilowatt hour. That's still on our system. We've got another, I think, 15 years left on the contract, right? We are putting much larger solar onto our system in places that are among the highest in per acre land costs, are amongst the most difficult in terms of permitting and community involvement. And kind of what Tom was saying earlier, that cost of those new solar farms, the production cost is actually less than the incremental production cost on the 60 megawatts share of a new coal plant that came online in 2010. Ultra supercritical, fully controlled. The solar we're putting in, in one of the worst places you'd want to put solar in Western Colorado, uh, just for difficulty's sake, beats it, right? So talk of catching the falling knife. If I want to make an investment, Paul, in battery storage, do I do it today or after listening to you, do I wait for the 3x at 20% of the cost that's coming on the horizon? How do, how do I think of this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, less on the business side at this point in my life, but the amount of potential investment needed for this change is dramatic, and it's very different than it was before. So if you take a look at... Uh, an electric vehicle, an autonomous electric vehicle, uh, the amount of content in an average car that comes from software and electronics is going to move from the current car at around 10% to 40% of the car. 
and it's completely so four times the amount and the sort of investment required on that is radically different because the the amount of data that an autonomous electric vehicle is going to be collecting driving around and 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 uh, uh, identifying its environment and that the roads are changing every day because of construction and so on it's vitally important to, to to suck that all in and then push it back out to the fleet um, uh, and to, to, to really about autonomous electric vehicles, it's mostly about data management. Um, you know, around that, you need 5G. So the whole 5G yeah. discussion that you probably read about in the last week on Qualcomm and so on, that sort of system, all that infrastructure required in order to, to have this change in electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, which is going to happen, uh, is going to be very different. If you look at the utility system, a tremendous amount is going to be needed on charging. And so charging infrastructure, whether it's uh, what I would call regular charging uh, or uh, high-speed charging, the, 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 the amount of CapEx required for that utility system to absorb that, that's a tremendous amount associated with it. So there's, I, I, there's a number of different areas uh, that are going to be new, are going to be different, are going to be opportunities associated with it. And it's, I think it's very exciting. I, I am a little bit more uh, positive than my friend Tom here about, uh, about where we're at on, on this particular topic, uh, us as a country. Um, for us as a country, the rest of the world generally looks at what Tesla and some of the other are doing, and they're, they are not particularly comfortable about their situation. As you probably know, I'll talk about the Europeans. A lot of them focused on diesel. We all know what's happened with diesel over the last couple of years. And they're all now worried that, that they're going to you know, have a very challenging time to compete against the American leaders on this topic. And once again, batteries are important. And yes, uh, you know, I think the comments, some of the comments made about China and what I would call current technology batteries, they do do uh, quite a bit. We still do quite a bit. But once again, our innovation cycle is well beyond what the Chinese do, and they try to uh, get our innovation. That's a whole longer conversation. I'd rather not get into here. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, but it's not all about batteries. A lot of it has to do with computing. A lot of it has to do with electric infrastructure. I am very positive about our leadership position in this particular area. I'd say the Chinese are more about uh, taking the innovation than getting the innovation. Um, let, me, let me go to your business model question. Um, so business model is kind of a term of art, but, but to us it sort of links strategy to economics. It's how you make money. It's how you elect to make money. So a lot of that is really about uh, you defining a purpose and defining a role and then kind of defining the way in which you would execute. So if I'm, if I'm thinking about, um, let's just take you know, electric transport. Um, and this, this is broader than EVs when you think about transport. So you can think about electric transport as a different stage of electrification. because That's really what it is. You go to an airport like Will Rogers here and you look at the number of vehicles that are around there probably are diesel-based, baggage handlers, um, <clears throat> anything that moves stock between um, gates, things like that. The, um, <clears throat> the notion of the business model is, is about trying to figure out a unique way in which just Differentiate, differentiate yourself from your competitors in terms of how to go to market and how to make money. In the power sector, it's been really hard to be unique um, because state regulations sometimes constrain you uh, so that you really uh, sort of revert to the norm, to the average. <clears throat> um, but when you start thinking about new technology deployment and new markets and new products and services, and I think you get into a set of capabilities that uh, are very different than what utilities typically have. So we like to think about capability sets that people need. Uh, kind of start with, you know, they, well, they kind of come in whatever order, but let's just start with origination. They need to understand how to go to market because utilities have never really had to go to market in the past. They need to understand how to develop products and services because we never really had to do that. The most we ever did was maybe get creative about industrial pricing when required. Um, you know, we need to understand how to form partnerships. And the, the power sector has never been good about partnerships. It's always a sharp elbows industry. Uh, even if you have minority ownership in a plant, you don't you don't play well that way. 
um, you, you need to think about um, what the channels to market are. And we've never had to really think about that in the past because we had sort of one product. It was the commodity. It was not differentiated, and it went to everybody. And the only price was differentiated based on load factors and other special considerations. You know, we, we need to think about ways to deploy financing because customers want someone to help finance. Their, they have economic pressures. Um, it's not that some of these companies don't have better balance sheets than the power sector, but they want you to kind of take part of that risk from them. Um, you need to be technologically savvy. Uh, and, it's, and it's not the same thing when people have talked about corporate systems now to talk about operating systems because the operating systems uh, have been around for decades, but now, but now they're, they're getting juiced up in terms of what their, their capability set is you know, themselves. They're becoming much more powerful. Um, you, you need to be able to, to think about how do you get your organization to be innovative. Uh, Michael talked about the culture of innovation, maybe something we come back to here, but it needs to be something that is ubiquitous or embedded within the business itself. It's not just being led by some you know, innovation group you know, that's sitting off you know, to the side. Um, <clears throat> you, you need to think about how to bundle. You know, with what you have, and go to market with a package as opposed to go to market with a with a single product. So there's a variety of capabilities that you need to be able to employ, develop, and employ to be able to create the business model, because the business model ultimately will get back to how do I think about packaging, and pricing, you know, in a way that allows me to get some kind of you know differentiated position, and what am I actually bringing to the market in terms of a technology or the application of that technology in a way that people haven't seen before. I was listening to the list of characteristics that you describe, kind of the ideal platform for, for dealing with this. And as you went down the list one by one, I was thinking about my own experience, both with um, utilities great and small during my EPRI days, partners that I worked with at the lab, and my own experience now. And I was thinking to myself, nope, 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 nope. Today's culture in the utility sector, and Michael, you can, you're nodding your head. It's, it's very much the opposite. We've been doing the same thing the same way. It served us well. Why do we need to change? Uh, and I, I think the cultural pieces are as much a challenge as perhaps even more so than, than the technological ones. So they say that, that time flies when you're having fun. We're into the last 20 minutes of the session here, and I do want to open it up to some uh, questions and conversation from the audience. So um, do we have folks with microphones anywhere that can help us out? Or do I get to play Oprah Winfrey? There we go. And no, I'm not giving away new cars or new battery storage or anything like that. While we're getting ready, I'll just to follow on, on Tom's point. Um, in the electric vehicle space, we're actually considering at Holy Cross a model where we would use our balance sheet to loan or lease the electric vehicle, the supply equipment, the charger, um, but also invest in charging at workplaces, charging in our service territory as part of a subscription service. So that if somebody wants to, you know, basically subscribe to an electric vehicle, they can do so for one low flat monthly rate and have kind of the mobility service more so than the vehicle asset itself. And I think we can think about that as a way of thinking differently about what we do. Now that, that's that's very Spotify of you. Yeah, well, we're, <laughs> we're considering it, which is uh, aggressive for a rural cooperative. Um, but whether we do it or not is, is or remains to be seen. Okay, questions? Let's start right over here. You'd mentioned uh, advanced communities with uh, renewable grids. Well, so how far away are we from a larger community having an AI integrated grid along with solar charged batteries that are almost independent from fossil fuels? We've just built one in Birmingham, Alabama that will, um, it has community solar, it has uh, battery storage, it has backup um, tier four EPA uh, generation. Uh, using natural gas and it also, uh, that microgrid controlled by uh, some software from Oak Ridge National Labs will optimize how, it will use machine learning to understand how people use energy. The homes are built with every bit of technology we've ever dreamed of having access to from the ground up. So imagine instead of trying to sell it into a market and not really under, not really having comparable data, we'll have the these 62 homes will have uh, the ability to 
there will never be an outage in this uh, community, or I don't think there will be, uh, unless there's a grid or something we've been trying to test. Our, our value coming back from that is how will people use energy in the future? Much more efficient homes, all that technology. How will you interact with it? Will you interact with all that stuff and try and optimize your energy when everything is that efficient, when the passive systems are that good, when the thermal envelope is as good as it is, when the variable, variable drive cooling systems manage all this stuff for you, when all this technology is in the background, it's set and forget, will you care about managing your lights and things like that? It will really be much more about comfort, convenience, and so forth, and allow the technology to really enable that. Let me add something to that. So Michael's, I think, spot on in his last comments here. What really matters, I think, to the customer right now is <clears throat> it's more around comfort, convenience, control, communication, maybe choice. Um, those are the kind of things that matter. Now, that's not to take price out of the, the equation, but price is hard to solve very quickly. Um, I think one thing to, to consider is just like the earlier panel had this question about socialization, I think the industry, you know, happens to have it around technology too. So who uses the technology? Um, so to your question about how fast can we get someplace, well, um, you got to think about that ubiquitous nature. We have uh, short of a trillion dollars of investment, you know, in the utility industry that sits out there um, in one form or another, <clears throat> and that's not going to get replicated, you know, overnight. And remember, that's at an average cost as opposed to replacement cost. Um, so you're going to have to figure out a way that you change things out because not everybody can be a newly constructed smart division, smart home. <clears throat> you're, you're talking about much broader uh, application of that. So it's going to have to you know, come in waves. So it is going to take developmental time to get there. And the socialization aspect comes in whether we're talking about e EVs in this case or something else is who pays for that. Brian brought this question up earlier. Um, you know, right now the utility and the telecommunications industry used to have a universal service fund. I think they probably still do, <clears throat> where it's socialized cost of providing communication services, you know, to, to rural, um, the rural, the rural population. The utility sector has had something around low-income uh, heating assistance, LIHEAP, <clears throat> which basically is socializing cost for uh, less affluent customers to be able to, you know, pay, you know, their heating bill requirements. If you start moving technology in, for example, uh, for ET and you're putting up charging stations, well, who uses the charging stations? It depends on you know who's buying new cars that are going to be electric vehicles. And depending on the model proliferation, more people, I think, are going to be buying upscale than downscale. We're going to move from Leafs, Priuses, and Volts you know, to the you know, pick your high-end auto manufacturer that has you know, moderate to higher price services. <clears throat> and those charging stations will be either placed, um, configured, uh, location-wise in a way to kind of hit driving patterns for a broad number of people, or sometimes they'll be placed closer to where load centers might be and who those users might be, but who pays for those things. So the socialization question around technology deployment really comes into play around who's going to benefit from it. And for right now, the regulated sector has always said we average those costs across everybody. Will it stay that way going forward? And, and it's not immediately clear that every consumer is going to want the same thing. There are going to be a lot of consumers that want what I call plain old grid supply, which is the equivalent to plain old telephone service way back when. But then there will be the consumer that says, look, energy company or whomever, new student with new entrepreneurial vision, I want you to keep my home between 68 and 72. I want you to help me keep my food from spoiling. I want you to make sure that my vehicle is uh, charged every time I plug it in and it's less than a quarter charge. I want you to use as much renewable energy as possible to reduce my carbon footprint. And I want you to do it for under $100 a month. You handle this, right? Because the consumer want something in terms of a set of products and services, but they don't want to feel like they've got to be the ones to do that. They want somebody to do it for them. And I think if, you know, back to my old adage and what Tom also says, if we don't manage our business to provide that product and service, then there's a huge opportunity for all of y'all. Yeah. I mean, I think the possibility of doing that is, is can be right on the cusp. I mean, the reality is, could someone build an interface on your Apple phone, uh, on, on your iPhone, i.e. an app, with all the decisions that you just listed, uh, have an integrated system that controls uh, where power goes to in your house, uh, and basically creates the algorithm on the base of an algorithm based on your menu of inputs from your iPhone, 
and basically AI your house in terms of I'm going to shut down the refrigerator during the heat of the day because I know if it goes up by two degrees and my refrigerator is not going to have an impact on my food, yeah. but it's going to save me a lot of money, right? And you just literally it, – it's very easy as a user interface, once again, flowing into the algorithm and providing a service. Uh, these things are, are completely possible. One of the things that – the one place I like to look at as an example, and three of us run, you know, run utilities, but I, I like to pick another one. I apologize. Um, but, but Southern California Edison in, around L.A. is at, the, is at the, one, one of the forefronts of this because it, it's kind of just kind of thrust upon them. The amount of residential solar uh, in their service territory is dramatic. Uh, the amount of people who drive electric vehicles who could, uh, if the right system's in place, have vehicle-to-grid battery, which is basically all the batteries feeding back into the grid from all these electric vehicles if the right construct is there, is vast, obviously, in, in, in Los Angeles. Um, so the, the previous map from the very beginning – sorry, I keep, uh, keep uh, applying to your, your, your layouts – about this distributed grid – they refer to themselves now as not a utility much of the time, but as a distributed grid manager. Yeah. And the amount of inputs, you know, as was described in the, in the intro by Brian, all these different in inputs, all these different outputs um, from many different types of generation sources and all the challenges it puts on INC and, uh, and distributed uh, and, and the grid system uh, from, a, from a hardware point of view, is vast right now uh, and moving moving very quickly in Southern California as a result of, of, all, of all that. And the opportunity there for the utility, the, the opportunity there for electric vehicle owners and charging entities is moving very fast and it's very exciting. And it's a great test bed on a pretty large scale as a result of the size of that system um, to move forward. And, uh, you know, some of these individual home points – you know, uh, in theory, we you know we could be at the at the right edge of uh, being able to do that. We have the technology right now to be able to do the, some some of those sort of things. Let me, let me just raise one more question for you here. Um, <clears throat> of the five C's, I kind of rattled off. You talked about a couple of them: having a choice, having options, and being able to exercise some degree of control over what I want. Um, <clears throat> but there's a question that's sort of looming out there: you know, industrial customers, heavy users, <clears throat> they're, they're acutely aware, you know, of energy costs. <clears throat> commercial customers are also acutely aware because of the amount of square footage that they tend to control. <clears throat> Power costs um, in the United States are at the lowest they've been since way back <clears throat> in the last millennium. Um, we're at about 1.34% of the disposable personal income. So there's a question out there. We have all this technology that is available and will be coming available at an increasing cascading you know, rate of change. The question will become, will people care? Because right now, when you, when you walk into a room, you know, you just flip the switch, you want light to come on. You want you know, the, the premise to be heated. <clears throat> we have um, prices have been escalating because of the investment, but actually prices have been flattening out. So will it be enough of an impetus? When I pick up my iPhone, you know, I know what I can do with my iPhone. It's very tangible to me. It's very visual. When I think about energy, it's invisible to me except when it doesn't work. So will we be able to actually get people aware enough of the kinds of technological advancements that are available to them that they can take advantage of? And that's the principal challenge for all industries. You know, it's in the oil and gas industry is to make sure that you know all producers and everybody are focused on what it takes from an environmental perspective and how to deploy the technology in the most effective, efficient, and in fat, rapid manner. From a utility perspective, it's how do I make sure people understand that this is something that can provide economic benefit to them with no diminution to safety or reliability. What I find interesting about that comment, Tom, and I get ribbed by this a lot from my analyst friends, is that the price of the commodity, electricity, has been going down steadily, both at the wholesale, you know, upstream in the big projects, as well as retail in the downstream. But the cost of the delivery infrastructure has been going up substantially, so much so that I'm starting to get questions, not only from my large customers, but from our individual members. Hey, costs are dropping like a stone. How come my rates aren't going down either? And it's because the, the mix of the investments in that rate, you know, the amount of money I got to get hasn't changed. It's just shifted out of buying power to fixing infrastructure and creating new stuff. And, I, and, and what I think is that unless we give the consumer a way to mitigate that, uh, 
price will become an issue for them. And then the answer is not them asking us for new products and services. It's them trying to figure out how they do it with somebody other than us. Yeah, so we, if you think about you know, kind of what you're just asking, the mix of the investment, you know, we're spending less on generation yeah. than we ever have. Transmission is really hard to see. It's really small. It's you know, 15% of most companies' investment levels. And in the focus on grid modernization, you know, the industry looked at it as a way to grow and a, and a way to modernize and a way to put more technology in the system. But that's what's carrying the cost right now. So it's going to take more creative pricing. You know, this industry is always priced, um, you know, sort of a declining cost basis. You know, maybe the industry ought to be approaching itself in, in terms of new investment on levelized basis. Yeah. So that you minimize the amount of the front end investment, spread it out over a lot longer period. Okay. So at the rate of 10 minutes per question, we have time for half <laughs> of a question. Um, but, but obviously some, some great discussions. Let's go center back right there, sir. I have a public policy question. Has the cost of generating wind industry declined enough that it no longer needs state or federal subsidy? You handle that? <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll step out there. <clears throat> This is this is always you know the consultant always shows up with the bullseye on their chest, <clears throat> so you, you can you can shoot me. I, I was using the moderator's privilege of silence, right? <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm gonna kick it to him because he has part of that in his business. But I, I would say yeah, I would say on on wind we're past that. I would say on solar not quite. And you see that reflected in the nature of the federal tax incentives that are in place right now. The wind tax, the production tax credit is on a ramp to be sunset here in a few years. The solar investment tax credit, not too far behind that. Um, there are lots of other tax credits being floated about and extended. Uh, Michael Ming talked about the carbon capture and sequestration one in the, in the last session. Um, I heard there was one introduced for coal and nuclear the other day. In the, in, the, in the House of Representatives. So um, it's an interesting world. So we're at 18% generation from renewables right now. That's pretty close to nuclear. Just, just a quick question on the role of, we've talked about EVs, uh, and I, I guess you could presume by the investments being made in the, in the transportation sector that electric vehicles are, are what people are putting their money into. Uh, people in this room were, you know, pretty excited to five, ten years ago about the evolution of compressed natural gas and mini LNG in the transportation sector. How do you guys see that uh, playing out in, in, you know, in terms of its viability as part of the mix? Uh, we, so we have um, uh, AGL resources, so we are a provider of compressed natural gas for transportation. Uh, we also, uh, uh, so we offer both those options, class seven and above is really well suited for compressed natural gas. We think that's a that's sort of a sweet spot for that. Just the ener energy density of it works particularly well. But if you have battery breakthroughs <clears throat> at the levels that Paul was talking about, uh, the, the, the capability is going to move up the stack very, very quickly in terms of what could uh, be served with, uh, with batteries and so forth. And then it's going to become a cost and also an infrastructure question. Which infrastructure gets built out? Do you build out a gas distribution infrastructure for LNG or do you, uh, or I'm sorry, compressed natural gas or do you build out an infrastructure for charging? Uh, and the charging infrastructure, there's, there's some momentum behind that right now. Uh, the Electrify America, which comes out of diesel gate from VW, they're investing a couple billion dollars. Utilities have invested uh, a couple billion uh, so far, but if you look at the investments here, it's swamped by the investments that are going on in China right now. I think China feels like they missed the uh, the ice, the opportunity to play there. But as we talk about what the makeup of an EV is going to be, it's a battery on wheels. It's a laptop on wheels, effectively, and China is well suited to to do that. In 2013, more than half of the EV market was U.S. Today, we're a small fraction. We're about 20%. China is more than half of the EV market. So that's why all the battery manufacturers are going to China. There's a ready market for it. There's an insatiable demand for 
uh, lithium ion. Again, if there are breakthroughs in technology that will allow <clears throat> more, but I think it's a, I think it's an all of the above. I think we need compressed natural gas to play a very significant role in powering and 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 it's a an much more efficient energy in some ways for a lot of applications, and it has an important role. Just one follow-up point here. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about China, and China is is the battery manu leading battery manufacturer and multiple companies in the top ten. Um, <clears throat> and when you talk about how you apply that to, to ET, they're t they're talking about an entirely different price point than would ever work over here. So they're talking about vehicles under nine thousand dollars. So then you have to ask yourself, well, okay, so what's that like? Uh, only followed by India, who's trying to get it under seven thousand dollars. <clears throat> so they're they're approaching things from a very different kind of model. But it's, it's what China does. You know, not that long ago, they were putting a coal plant into, into service every single week. They have hundreds of cities right now which are called ghost cities, you know, where they've spent billions of, of dollars, and nobody occupies these cities. And they're, they're great-looking places. They look like they built the Olympics with some, some of the style of architecture. But China is just the worst model uh, to be thinking about, but they certainly can get something done when they want to do it. And I, I want to end on a little bit of a cautionary note about electric vehicles. We've seen this movie before. We saw this with natural gas vehicles in the 90s and the early 2000s. We saw this with hydrogen highway and the move towards hydrogen infrastructure and so on. And we're seeing kind of the same, same strains of the movie with respect to EVs and its infrastructure. When we look at it from a local standpoint, we're being asked to put the infrastructure in today on spec that we're going to see these 20, 40 percent year-on-year growths in vehicles, and we might be able to make our money back in five or 10 years' time. That's that's akin to saying I'm going to make a 30-year investment in a really big power plant, and I'm going to hope that the market remains the same for the next 30 years, and everything goes according to plan. And I think we've seen numerous examples as of late where things just happen to change a little bit faster than we might have thought. I mean, if, if I could just make one final comment to be slightly repetitive from up front. From a technology and innovation point of view, the U.S. is where it's at. We're at the peak of where we've been at for the whole life of energy, oil and gas production, what we're doing on batteries, uh, across a, uh, the, th this grid management and dealing with uh, machine learning and potentially even artificial intelligence. We're the lead in that. And this is an exciting time for everyone here in the room, whether you're in oil and gas, whether you're in renewables, whether you're in electric vehicles. Uh, and technology and innovation has driven that for this country. It's a wonderful place to be. It's a run wonderful sector to be. It's a strength of the United States. It went from where we were in the 70s to being a price taker and a volume taker from OPEC to where we are today around exporting, being the number one producer. So this is an exciting time. Uh, ho hopefully everyone feels that. Uh, it's an exciting time for us, obviously, uh, who have uh, leadership roles and, and participate. So, so uh, hopefully everyone else feels the same. Great last word. Thanks to our panelists for an insightful and illuminating discussion. Hope you pick up a thing or two. Um, for those of you who are basketball fans, we're uh, midway through the first half, and it is too close to call. So <laughs> stay tuned. Thanks once again. Thank you to, thank you to our panel. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break. It's very apparent to me that advances in uh, power generation, transmission, distribution are occurring at a very fast pace, much faster than I anticipated, uh, which also tells me that I need to upgrade my iPhone to accommodate the, uh, uh, the new app, the applications coming out to manage my microgrid. 10-minute break, and we'll be back. Dave Lawler will be here to give us a keynote address. <laughs>